All right, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, Martin is going to be presenting his work for his master's thesis on mobile augmented reality and geosocial networking. And if I'm not incorrect, this is your last week with us. So cheers for coming along. And yeah, thank you, Roy. Give him a big hand first. Thanks, Adrian, and uh, thanks everybody for coming along here and participating in my last little adventure here in uh, New Zealand. I'm uh, actually heading back to a cold European winter here within the next uh, 48 hours. So it's a great opportunity just to talk a little about my work and yeah, maybe get some input for my thesis uh, for the future. So yeah, basically my, the ultimate goal of my thesis is to look into the combined potential of um, augmented reality and social media because uh, apparently this is an area that is relatively under-investigated within uh, AR. So this could be an area where I could provide my little contribution to the community. Um, but actually my thesis will, will also contain uh, another part, which is a collaboration I've started with the, the lab here and uh, with the, the New Zealand Historic Places Trust, which is about uh, geotagged interviews down in the High Street area here in Christchurch. Um, the idea is to, they're, ga they're gathering uh, interviews with uh, people with a historic relation to the area so people can walk down the street and listen to interviews with these people. So one of my big challenges is to sort of combine these two different areas into one coherent master's thesis. This will be quite interesting, but yeah, see how it goes. Uh, so first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from Denmark, which is a relatively small country in Europe. So we are surrounded by these big neighbors to the north, Norway and Sweden, and Germany to the south. So yeah. Uh, we have yeah, about 5 million inhabitants. Uh, I grew up in a little city called Sindal, which is, yeah, we have like 5,000 inhabitants. But I live and study in Aalborg, which is, I think, the fourth biggest city in, in Denmark. So, yeah. Uh, so I was actually originally a linguistics student, so I used to speak German and French and, on a good day, uh, Latin as well. Um, but yeah, after my high school years, I didn't really know what to do. But then I found this uh, education that I found really interesting. It's called Mediology, uh, which I'll talk a little more about here in a second. Uh, so I got my bachelor degree in Mediology last year, and I continued immediately on to the master's program, where I specialize in interaction design, stuff related to that area. So uh, yeah, next to my studies, I'm also a vice chairman of the study board of the media technology, uh, and I'm an ambassador ambassador for the IT education at my university. So um, in my spare time, I enjoy uh, playing and recording um, my own electronic music composition. I have my own really small uh, studio back in Denmark. Uh, so if I win the lottery once, I plan on you know expanding that studio a bit because I really enjoy uh, recording electronic music. Um, I used to do a lot of sports. I play football, uh, tennis. Um, and now one of my big interests is tramping. <laughs> Having been in New Zealand here for five months, I really enjoy going out into nature, and I hope to continue with that when I get back to Denmark. So, yeah, so this uh, education uh, is called Mediology. It's really a crossover education, combines uh, arts, design, and technology, and communication. Uh, so throughout the bachelor education, we got exposed to a lot of uh, programming courses, um, human-computer interaction, and um, Related aspects is really a huge part of, of the education. Also film art, uh, sound design, sensor technology, uh, animation, computer graphics, uh, user eva evaluation through ethnographic methods and usability and stuff like that. So it's really a little bit of everything, yeah. So here are some of my earlier projects from my bachelor education. Uh, my apologies for the somewhat the goofy titles. That's just part of meteorology, I think. So in the top right part is like a projector-based um, ice skating game where uh, people skate around on the ice and you have like a game projected down on the surface and you can gather points around by skating around and you have to avoid the obstacles on the path uh, on the game as well. The uh, middle thing there is like an interactive touch table which you use for idea generation and creativity. Um, yeah, just the early stages of project development. Uh, and then 
uh, this is an experiment combining uh, sound design and sensor technology. Uh, I don't know, quite funny project, but we had like, uh, we made two gloves with sensors on them, and people could play music by tapping each other's heads and stuff. It's pretty crazy. So we made like a graphical user interface where people could uh, drag different sounds uh, through these gloves and you know use them to play music. Um, and the sounds themselves were some sounds that we made ourselves, like com by combining uh, sine waves. And we were focusing on drum sound, so it ended up sounded quite uh, horrible. You know, if you make combined sine waves to to create uh, drum sounds, it sounds really awful. But uh, it's a good experiment. And then uh, the bottom uh, left part is a project called J Jungle Stories, which was about um, uh, the impact of sound design on the people's perception of an animated story. So we made different sound designs and compared uh, and investigated how people would perceive the story. So as you might uh, sense, these uh, projects are all somewhat uh, prototype based. For instance, uh, the gloves, we, we, um, we used tape to attach the sensors to the glove. Uh, so it's really prototype based. It's not something that you would uh, go out and sell to the industry. But it's all right in mediology to show ideas and concepts. It doesn't have to be uh, finalized, you know, as projects ready to sell. I've also done some more uh, serious projects in a way, more, you know, pointing towards something a little more useful, maybe. So my bachelor's my bachelor thesis was using computer vision to analyze the exposure of the advertisements. So we got into a lot of um, image processing algorithms and the more engineering aspects of um, of, um, of media technology, and which really gave us some more confidence um, towards some more, you know, engineering aspects, and we sort of played around with some more or less homeless, uh, homemade um, uh, blob labeling algorithms and stuff. This is quite fun. It ended up working pretty well. And then, uh, project to the right is my uh, first project on my uh, uh, in my master's education, which focused on uh, Kinect interaction. We were comparing different ways uh, Kinect games. Uh, uh, used interaction methods, um, uh, evaluating the ex existing ones and also proposing some new uh, methods which we thought would suit uh, this kind of interface better. And also we looked into how you, um, how you can um, teach new users to a natural interface as they connect who are not necessarily uh, used to this kind of interaction. That's kind, kind of interesting. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, the final project that I did before I came down here was a mobile application, an Android application for infrastructure management. We had a collaboration with a Danish uh, company specialized in uh, uh, GIS solutions. So they wanted to have um, an application which, which uh, infrastructure managers in the municipalities uh, could use to track and update infrastructure assets. So often in, um, in municipalities, they have like hundreds of thousands of different um, infrastructure assets that need maintenance over time, and the process of um, locating and uh, maintaining these assets is often really tedious. And the idea was to use a smartphone to uh, to sort of track and update the status uh, of these um, these different assets. And quite by coincidence, uh, th this was also my first experiences with uh, augmented reality. So instead of just having this. Uh, map view of the different assets located around in the city. We also implemented an augmented reality view. It was kind of uh, interesting because, uh, yeah, I learned many lessons about the problems and also the opportunities of augmented reality. Um, so the limitations of GPS uh, tracking and mobile sensors, really huge issues. The interaction design as well was not as straightforward as we had imagined. But one of the interesting things we found out that was that for a certain tasks, for instance, uh, pathfinding and stuff, augmented reality really had some benefits over top-down um, cartography, uh, as you see here. So people would, uh, we, we set up an experiment, and people would normally go into the map view first to see where the assets are located. But then as they moved along, uh, they easily got disoriented by using the map. So they would swift, switch to the AR view to sort of take bearing of the environment and locate um, the assets and say, okay, I'm heading in that direction. And this is kind of an interesting observation. But most of all, I found out that mobile augmented reality is really useful and it's really fun to play around with. So it's quite um, great for me that I had the opportunity to come down here to the HitLab and 
also followed Mark's course on augmented reality. So yeah, it's quite interesting. But yeah, <clears throat> back to my uh, thesis. So uh, first of all, the reason why I wanted to focus on mobile AR is because I like the context. Um, when you develop applications for a mobile platform, you have uh, users who have really much, uh, really divided attention and not focus solely on their mobile um, experience, but also have uh, tasks in the real world that they want to accomplish. Um, but many of the tasks that users, uh, that mobile users um, are involved with is often related to some kind of uh, location-based uh, service. So for instance, locating and navigating and searching. Um, and at the same time, uh, some of the pioneers in uh, wearable and mobile computing, uh, augmented reality, sorry, uh, found out that AR can really be a useful interface for location aware uh, services. And then an observation, an observation that uh, I have made is that social media often contains some kind of location-based information. Uh, so if you see on Facebook, you can often uh, you can tag your uh, photos and um, relate them to some kind of uh, geographic location. And there is a map feature as well. And the middle one is uh, Twitter 360, where you can see the, your friends, um, their latest tweets and where they were located when they did that, that uh, their latest tweet. Uh, so what I'm really interested in is what is the connection between these uh, three different areas? And um, I want to develop a system that sort of takes the benefits from all of these systems into one uh, big uh, system and something that people would use, of course. <laughs> so I've been looking around with different, um, looking at different um, systems that combine these different areas. So first of all, the combination of mobile computing and social media. I stumbled upon this term called uh, geosocial uh, networking, uh, where you sort of have traditional social networking related to some kind of geo uh, information. Um, so there are some examples. Top right is uh, GeoLife, which is from Microsoft Research, uh, which uses uh, GPS uh, trajectories from multiple users to sort of find out what are the most interesting locations in this, uh, in this uh, particular region and then present this information on the, on the mobile display for another user. So uh, and the bottom uh, right is the Google Bus uh, mobile, which is now abandoned, I think, where you can see um, your friends uh, sharing content and uh, uh, which have uh, geographical information attached to it. And the left example is um, a messaging system where users could generate uh, HTML pages uh, and associate these uh, HTML pages with a particular geographical re region. So when a user with a mobile client would access uh, this, uh, the region of one message, it would get triggered and downloaded and displayed on the mobile phone. Um, so one of the limitations of this, these systems is that they focus on very specific services. Uh, either uh, geotag messages or uh, recommendation for, for users and doesn't really take the whole potential of uh, social networking into account. At least that's, that's my opinion. Uh, then there is uh, the combination of mobile computing and augmented reality. As you might know there are many examples of, um, of a mobile augmented reality. So there are two examples, uh, the layer where you can um, uh, use uh, print pages and associate these with some augmented uh, media, for instance, YouTube links, and URLs, and, and photos. So it's really useful for advertising. And then there's the Nokia CityLens, which uh, presents um, information about the nearby surroundings. Uh, for instance, uh, yeah, based on different categories, like here would be restaurants, and shopping, and, and culture. And also shows the distance to, um, to these, um, to these um, locations. Um, further, Nokia CityLens also has some really interesting uh, interface ideas and interaction uh, ideas where you sort of uh, swap around between different kind of views based on the orientation of the device, which is something that I also want to look into. Uh, but yeah, a little more of that later. And then the most interesting thing uh, which I found was, uh, yeah, the, the most interesting thing I found was the combination of augmented reality and social media because there's not at least what I've found, I've not found so many applications that sort of combine these two elements. So I found the Twitter 360, 
uh, which as I said before, you can see the, your friends' uh, latest tweets and where they were located when they posted the tweet. And another interesting um, system is the Socialize AR, um, which is based on conferences. And so visitors at a conference all wear a specific, um, their own personalized AR badge. So the other visitors can use their smartphone to scan this badge and information about their uh, LinkedIn profile would appear. Uh, and you had the, had the opportunity to view uh, the profile and also to connect with this uh, person. Uh, so the good thing about these two examples is that apart from combining social media and AR, they're actually mobile as well. So sort of have all these three elements uh, combined here in these two examples. Um, so it's a good point of departure for me, I guess, to look at how these two different systems work. Um, so that's really my point of departure. So some of the limitations that I have, that I have found in these uh, two examples and also yeah, the community in general is that they focus on very specific services and don't really take into account the, the, um, the broader uh, opportunities of each of these different uh, services. Um, so here in, um, you know, and also there are some uh, severe uh, privacy issues. You can imagine that this uh, socialized AR works really well in conferences where people sort of agree on the, the context and they all wear a badge and it's okay to hold up the phone to scan the, uh, another visitor. But what happens if you take this uh, idea out on the street uh, to random people and people you don't know and yeah, all, all kinds of things. It's really a huge issue. Also in Twitter 360, I haven't really looked too much into it, but I don't think it has become that big of a success because people need to explicitly specify that they want to reveal their geographic location. So it's not something people, it's something people have to, to turn on in order to, to use properly. So it's probably not so, so used. Um, and also what I find mostly important is that the, the social experiences of these um, of these uh, applications is somewhat limited. Again, it doesn't really take into account all the stuff that people would normally do on social media, and it doesn't really take into account the fully potential of AR as location-based services. So that's the things that I really want to look into um, a little later, <laughs> because right now I'm focusing on the other part of my thesis. So yeah, I have a twofold mission. This collaboration with the, the HitLab here and with the New Zealand Historic Places Trust, which focuses on augmented audio, and then this um, idea of integrating AR and social media into a, a coherent system. So yeah, my challenge is to find a context that would link these two different uh, aspects into yeah, a coherent system. So I have this um, context of city stories and I have this line that every city has a story to tell. And my idea is that focusing on city, city stories would provide a great context for both exploring um, augmented audio for instance, in the shape of interviews, um, and also provide a context where people would um, uh, would like to share media content and and, uh, and stories and and socialize with each other. Um, <clears throat> so that's my point of departure here for combining these elements. So it's easy to f find examples of uh, events and cities where you have like hist uh, great stories for people to share um, and discuss and also for telling stories. So this is, yes, just some random examples I found. Um, historic examples, the three on the top. And then, of course, the Christchurch earthquakes here in the, here in the city last year. Um, and of course, since I'm working with the New Zealand Historic Places Trust, I will primarily focus on the earthquake in Christchurch. So what the Historic Places Trust is doing now is to uh, gather interviews with people who have uh, uh, a historic relation to the area, uh, to the buildings down there. Um, and they want uh, people here in Christchurch to walk down the high street area and listen to these uh, interviews um, and get a f um, both a, a, an insight into what the city used to look like and also to remember uh, their own uh, memories from the, from the area. And it could possibly be integrated with the CityView AR application as well, which uh, displays uh, 3D buildings of the, of the buildings uh, that are now demolished. So yeah, you could imagine yeah, you had like this uh, beautiful person walking down with the earphones and 
he can hold up his phone um, and yeah, just have some kind of visual indication of where the audio files and the interviews are located and in some way activating uh, them and playing them back down in this, the, the high street area. Um, so some of the challenges that I have with this, um, with the geotagged audio is, uh, for instance, the audio playback. Um, one of the options that I really want to explore is to have all the audio files in a way playing at the same time while people walking down there and maybe play around with some 3D sound where the sound is, um, if you have a building and an interview located to your right, you would only hear uh, the sound in your right earphone, for instance. And as you walk towards an object, the volume would increase. And if you walk away from an, an object, it would decrease. Um, and the other option is, of course, to have like more user control that the user would activate the interview he or she wants to hear. Um, so that's one challenge uh, and, and one thing to explore. The other thing is uh, the use of visual cues. So because it's an audio experience, how much visuals, how, mu how, mu how much visuals should be integrated? Should it be thumbnails, images, simple uh, dots, as I showed before? Should it be text? Um, because one of my um, theories is that too many visuals will steal the focus away from the audio experience. And the same goes for if the application is to be integrated with the City View AR. You have a really great immersive experience in the City View AR and a potentially immersive experience that focuses on audio. And if you combine these two uh, things in one uh, system, what would that mean for the user experience? So I guess many of these uh, problems is something that, uh, that I need to talk to the New Zealand Historic Places Trust, what do they, what they want? But it could also be interesting just for my thesis work to maybe set up some experiments <clears throat> for myself uh, that sort of looks into these issues and, uh, and, uh, and, and provide different experiences for people that I could sort of do some evaluations on. <clears throat> so my status uh, so far. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's one of the things I'm actually starting to look a bit into here now. Um, I'm playing around with the IFMOD uh, sound engine. Um, I'm coming back to it a little later, but it's definitely one of the big challenges also because you walk down the street and there's potentially a lot of noise going on um, away, you know, away from the mobile phone. And how can you, yeah, that, that should be taken <laughs> into account as well. So, yeah, it's an important challenge. No, it's fine. You can. Um, so, just a quick question. Um, I suppose it's a generic question. So, the goal is to combine mobile AR and virtual media. Right? Yeah, that's one of my goals, yeah. Well, at, at the moment, I don't really see a social media too much at the moment. So, no. because of what you explained so far, it looks like. Down you're, visual. you're completely but, right, yeah. But like, like, like Twitter, where, you know, Twitter has, sort of has a receiving end, yeah. but also a producing end. So yeah. I guess you know, you know, maybe we should sort of probably look into not just having the user receive the audio, yeah. but then if you have a thing like basically another mobile AR browser that, that, that plays sound instead of visual. I'll actually come back to that a little later. What is the link between this? Uh, because this thing is really much related to what the Historic Places Trust want and hasn't really anything to do with social media at all. So my, ch my idea is to first uh, uh, do this stuff for the Historic Places Trust. And by using this context of city stories, use that to expand it into something that is related to social media. And I have some ideas for that, uh, which I could present um, in a second. Yeah, so so far I have um, yeah, set up the basic Android framework. It's been really important for me to get a grip with the outdoor AR library, um, which is developed by this lab, because uh, I might, yeah, might need some help at some point, and it's probably a good idea to sort of get all this, um, get a grip on the framework before heading back to Europe. So that's what I've been doing, and it's, um, it's been working out so pretty well so far. So I've just set up a, a basic system where a user can tap an icon, a visual icon on the screen, which indicates the location of a sound file. And this would play back an interview and show information about the interview content. Uh, so it's really basic, but allows me to play around with some different ideas. And I can easily um, expand it maybe to, to use uh, 3D sound and stuff. <clears throat> so 
So yeah, I'm playing around with FMOD at the moment for positioning the sound and also looking into how much user control should there be involved. Should the user uh, be able to adjust the volume, uh, pause and stop and rewind and forward and stuff like that. Um, that's also an interesting challenge, yeah. And the overall interface design uh, as well. I'm, um, I have a good uh, collaboration with uh, Lucy, who's doing an internship here now, and yeah, we have some, I've had some meetings about how we get along with it and continue the work remote here when I leave. So um, yeah, that's what I've been doing so far, and yeah, I think it's, it's working out all right. My plan is to have the audio component ready in January uh, with the possibility to expand uh, the, uh, the ideas, of course. And then, of course, uh, this, the problem of integrating the social media and the social networking thing um, <clears throat> when I have done the audio component. So by focusing on this context of city stories, I think that's a very uh, interesting context for sort of combining this idea of audio because um, city stories and interviews, well, it's often audio. Um, and to tell historic events, you can tell historic events, of course, through pictures and videos and stuff. But by through these interviews of, uh, with historic persons, that provides an, an additional, um, um, let's say, perspective. Also, if you focus on the mobile platform, you should limit the text-based input. So I think that audio, in some way, is a good replacement for text input um, in this context. So I just here yesterday, I just made this uh, sketch of uh, a mobile screen. So my idea is that if you are within a, the city of Christchurch or any city really, um, the buildings that are associated with some kind of social media content, <clears throat> when you hold up uh, your phone in front of these buildings, it would display this list to the left of the most recent um, user-generated content that are related to this building. Uh, so if this is uh, the old maths building here, uh, some of the people within this lab could have provided some audio comments, some video, or some photos, uh, like you would do on Facebook, really. The, the kind of media that you would share on Facebook. And of course, um, text input is not really a big uh, option here. It should be pretty limited. So I was thinking that audio files could somewhat replace it. And for the interface ideas uh, themselves, the idea would be, okay, if you put uh, the phone away from the old mass building and point towards any other buildings, well, this list would maybe disappear. And uh, instead, another list would pop up with the recent comments of people um, that have provided some content on this particular building. Um, and you can maybe uh, tap on the building itself to get you know, more information about um, maybe a longer history of what people have generated of content here. Um, so one of the things that I haven't really had time to look into so far is uh, the authoring. How do you let uh, people uh, generate content and author content directly from their phone? And that's really one of the things I want to look into once I get a bit further um, into the project. Uh, and it's probably there most of the challenges will lie. Should, people should be able to reply to the, both the user-generated content and also if there is a historic places trust in you know any city that has provided some uh, some content for everybody to share. How can people reply to these uh, these uh, to this content? Um, so I think you're having an explore mode where you could see basically everything that has been generated. Uh, you can see up in the top right. You can maybe toggle if you want to see only your own content or your friend's content or maybe the whole world's content. Um, and then there is this tour mode, which sort of could have this. Um, which is the, the content that has been generated for a, a predefined tour, like the one I'm doing for the high street area here. Um, and of course, there should be some kind of opportunity for people to reply to these kind of uh, media. But yeah, so far I'm focusing on the audio component that what I do for the Historic Places Trust, and then we'll see how far I can take uh, this idea of social networking I think there is a great potential <clears throat> in combining these elements and some challenges, of course, because it's on the mobile platform. But that's really just what makes it exciting to work with. So, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. 
do like what you are doing is kind of like a cross discovery because the use of the author was that it would be up to you to have a database tree. Yeah. And you think about like there is a way to classify them, to do some kind of way to start with their organization to simplify them there. For example, if one interested in something about like specific things which should be used, you could use the audience like that one. Yeah. Yeah, because right now it's actually just shows the latest uh, content that has been genera uh, generated. And I think it would make sense in the authoring um, uh, interface to have some ways to categorize the content that you want to share. And also, of course, here if you are in this explore interface, to have a way to uh, yeah, visualize this kind of uh, hierarchy. Uh, thinking it could be something like you could tap the building <coughs> itself and you could see um, you could enter another screen which would have um, all the content, but not, you know, in in con in a chronological mode, but in you know hierarchical uh, clusters and based on specific topics, maybe. Uh, but it's not something that I have thought of uh, so far. Yeah. Many people. So the question I'm asking was what like from your knowledge is it a problem or it's not? It's what kind of existing solution? Yes, it's a problem with the information filtering and stuff. Is that what you what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's more organizing, I would say, than filtering. Yeah. So organizing the information that people provide. So if it's an audio file or if it's a, a video or if the video has specific content, it should be grouped with. Other different content, yeah. Yeah, I haven't really looked uh, so much into it. Um, I have been um, looking at some different ways of uh, filtering the information and all, uh, by taking into account uh, what context the user is in at the moment. Um, so I don't know if there could be any way to sort of look into what is the user currently doing, what would he be interested in, uh, in seeing on the mobile display when he holds up the fr phone in front of the... Uh, Old mass building, for instance. Um, but he yeah, has some kind of context awareness would be interesting to look into in order to filter the information that should be visualized. Yeah, my question is if you filter users, do you look at Facebook people then to organize you? Because people live in the last oh, yeah. like our iPhone. So it's really the old iPhone which is ignore them. It's it's like uh, uh, my feeling is that could be the pin in the application. Uh, some application could be really only the I don't know, I'm just asking if, if this is a problem or not, because you look at the more recent and less recent. Depends on the yeah, if you want to do that, right? Because I was thinking, I like a lot the idea because uh, I, I read that this, this is a huge amount of data, but I guess it could be a really powerful tool for historians, anthropologists, or ethnographics uh, because they can have uh, in a timeline a lot of information about the perception of the historical places, so yeah. historical buildings. And this database could be really, really useful for this kind of research. So yeah. I was thinking that it could be a possible application of this. Yeah, that's actually a good point. And that would also take me a little way. I don't know why. I'm just I'm just thinking about you know Facebook. That's what everybody knows, and there's all these kind of you know user generated content. But it would actually make sense to focus on a more maybe particular experience yeah. by focusing on you know yeah the city itself and the history maybe, and only present that kind of information under the assumption that people really like to share, uh, you know, geographic uh, information and geographic content within, you know, the boundaries of a city. But I think it would take some extraordinary events to make a lot of people interested in it. But then you can always consider who's your target group. I mean, but here in Christchurch, it would make perfect sense because there's the, the earthquake history. And yeah, but what, what, what about other cities? I mean, would people be interested in that kind of, you know, social media? Ah, sorry, more than the immediate uh, experience or some historical moment, maybe. It's more in the analysis of historical moments in the city, I guess. But yeah. I'm not an anthropologist, maybe William knows more about it, but I guess for, for this kind of research, it's quite useful to know what's happening to the people because yeah. sometimes you don't have access to the interviews or direct interviews, but maybe you can get the information from this kind of social network that has some kind of statistics, some 
public is being used. Yeah. So that the hashtag is being used and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But in specific geographic locations, right? Yeah. And, and allies. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that sounds like a good option for, you know, focusing a little bit more instead of just saying, I want the whole, uh, all the stuff that people do on Facebook to put that down on a mobile device, because that wouldn't, I, I don't think it would work. That's a huge standard, like a, a huge standard for the, the, the way the knowledge is organized. If you think about cities, which is a major language, so if you think on it from Copenhagen, you won't find a place where if you are going to bring the dog in the middle of country, you want to say, like how uh, what's the sound when you hear when the people make the country speak the dog? Oh yeah. It was a war and it was a you know prosperity of all these things. Yeah. I think it's maybe so like not only geographic thing but also you need kind of a little timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually also one of the discussions that we have the, with the New Zealand Historic Places Trust. Um, they are kind of organizing uh, the audio tour into. Um, uh, different topics and also I guess related to different uh, <coughs> periods of time so they have some kind of timeline involved there and that would probably make sense but right now I haven't really gotten my mind into whether I should just focus on uh, every other things people do on Facebook or should try to organize it a bit more based on what the historic places trust are doing here for instance <coughs> and with the you know chronologi chronolo chronological uh, timeline and stuff it would be really, really interesting. I think it would really focus the project a bit more, maybe. So. You seem to be focusing a lot on the, the content that people produce um, in, in the reality check videos and in your being local to your local location. Um, can you talk a lot about email versus reality and what video that means? Is it easy to do that? Uh, only sparsely, a little yeah. bit, I've, I've thought of, but yeah, I haven't really, th it is really interesting because there are a lot of privacy issues uh, with that, uh, in terms of whether people want to reveal their geographic location and stuff, but um, it might be an aspect that I would, I would look into as well uh, at one point. Especially because I haven't, you know, focused it to 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 spe specify what kind of content do I want to focus on so far. So, but it would be quite interesting as well, also to uh, to look into the privacy aspects of it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's actually a bit like what the uh, yeah. That's actually a bit what the GeoLife project was doing. Automatically, like mine the GPS uh, trajectories of people. They're also um, um, generating uh, popular sequences for people to walk around the city. Use that information as well. That could also be really interesting to integrate into an, an AR interface. I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, I actually just wanted to say, yeah, thank you for coming here today. And also, yeah, I want to say thank you for, yeah, the last uh, five months. It's been really a great pleasure for me to come down here and stay here at the lab. It has really been, yeah, a great experience for me. And it's something that I think I'll carry along with me when I get back home and, yeah, move on. I hope, yeah, I'll see you guys some time soon. So, oh, yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, if there aren't any, or if there are any remaining questions which haven't just been covered, uh, fire away. <laughs>